Father, as we were singing today, Lord, we sang the words, show me your ways that I may walk with you. And Lord, it was impressed upon my heart that if we are to walk with you in truth, we must know what it is that you have for us. What are your ways and where can we find them? And Lord, we know today that we find your ways, your design, what you desire of us within your word. So God, as we gather together now to break the bread of truth, to open up your word, God, I pray that you would show us your way. God, and in following in obedience and faith, In accordance with your scriptures, your word, your way, we would walk with you in truth. God, give us understanding and insight into your word today. By the power of your spirit, bring revelation to our hearts and to our minds. Lord, and those of us who have surrendered unto you and live by the Spirit, God, I pray that by the power of that same Spirit, God, it would give volition to our actions, our fruit, our deeds. God, that we would desire and hunger for your righteousness and the completion and fulfillment of your will, that that would be the food of our lives. I ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. I invite you to turn to the book of John uh, chapter 2. I had hoped that we would begin chapter 3 today, but I didn't get to finish uh, everything that the Lord had laid on my heart uh, last week. And as I left this place, I thought, well, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and move on, but the, the Spirit really quickened in my spirit and said, no, I want you to continue to flesh this out. And then there was something that came up through the message and, and through an illustration that I gave that the Lord spoke to me on as well that I needed to address and, and flesh out further uh, today as well. So I want to begin by just reading verses 23 through 25 again to bring it to the foreground of our mind, and then we're going to depart from there and go on uh, another journey uh, as we discuss what was transpiring here in this passage and what Jesus was talking about. So let's just begin this morning uh, reading John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And indeed, no one needs to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And as we began to unpack all that was there and and talk about the things that were going on, we discovered that here Jesus is confronting this superficial kind of belief, a superficial kind of faith, one that only believes because they saw evidence of something. And so we define through Hebrews 11 that faith is in fact the evidence of things not seen. And I gave you an example. Does anybody remember the example that I gave last week? Blue marble, right? And and that was not something that I had intended or planned, and and so I want to explain a little bit further, and then that's going to be the close of the message today is to address something that occurred there that I want all of us to understand and be aware of. But in the blue marble example, I asked the question, How many of you believe that I have a blue marble in my pocket? And the response was that no one believed that. And so I said, well, why do you not believe that? And Kim gave us the answer. Kim, what was the answer? Why did you not believe? You didn't see the blue marble. You didn't have the evidence that that was, in fact, in my pocket. And so then we talked about faith and defined all of that and looked all of that. And I asked the question again. How many of you believe that I have a blue marble in my pocket? And upon hearing the definition of faith, and as we discussed that, a few of you then said, okay, well, I I believe I'm going to trust my pastor. I'm going to trust that he does, in fact, have a blue marble. AJ raised his hand. He's been mad at me ever since uh, because I was a charlatan. I did not, in fact, have a blue 
marble in my pocket. And my, my heart and my intent and my purpose in that was never to lead anyone astray, but it was just to illustrate that sometimes faith has to operate despite evidence of things you don't see. That's the very definition. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So it was only used as an example, but through that, Something was birthed in my mind and heart to show the something that we need to be aware of and cautious of, and I want to address that at the end. But so we look at faith, and here Jesus is showing that these people were superficial. They did not have a sincere, genuine faith in him because the only thing they saw was his power in action, and they thought that that would be of great benefit to them in conquering Rome. And so we look at this, and it says here that he did not then entrust himself to them because he knew what was in their heart. And so I want us to look at what the difference between a sincere belief or a sincere faith is in verses 1 that is just a professed version of that. I turn to the book of James, chapter 2, and as you're turning there, I want to uh, bring something up to the foreground of our minds. Uh, one of the verses that I shared was Matthew 3, 9, and in that, John the Baptist, when the Pharisees come and they're seeking for baptism, he, he tells them, well, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, you must bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So when you repent and you turn from your sin and you turn unto Christ, you're going to bear fruit that's going to be evidence of that. And when you see fruit or works or deeds in the scriptures, it's referring to the same thing. The things that we do as we live our life, that is going to be that which people see, and that's going to be the fruit of our life. That's going to be the works of our life, the deeds of our life, and the scriptures even speak of this. In Galatians 5, you have there the fruit of the Spirit, right? Y'all know that it's there. You know that it's called the fruit of the Spirit. But just before that, as Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, he also says, here are the fruits or works of the flesh. And so we're either going to bear fruit that is going to come from the spirit of the living God, or we're going to bear fruit that comes from our flesh. Those are the only two options that each of us have. And the scripture says that we are going to bear fruit. Every one of us in this room is going to be a fruit bearer. And so the question then is, well, are you going to be bearing fruit of the spirit or fruit of the flesh. And then Jesus gives his followers and his disciples a warning. He says, you must examine fruit. You must look to fruit because you're going to know them, talking about the Pharisees or genuine believers and followers of Christ, by their what, church? By their fruit. You're going to know them through that. How is that so? How is that possible? It's because the way they live, the things that they do, the things that they say and participate in, is evidence of whether or not a heart has been rendered new through Jesus Christ. That's the only way that that's going to happen. Your heart is only going to be transformed and made new through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that is received and done by what? Faith. Faith alone. So let's look at this. Uh, you're, you're there in James chapter 2. I want to bring up another passage of scripture. We don't have to turn there, but I, I want to talk about it. In Matthew chapter 17, or 7, beginning, uh, I think it's verse 21, 22, somewhere in there. Jesus says, many are going to come to me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord. So they're going to come and they're going to make a profession and they're going to say, you are our Lord. You are our master. We follow you. And didn't we do things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons and do many mighty works in your name? And his response to this group of people is, I didn't know you. We did not have intimate relationship. We were not joined together by faith. They had the works, but they didn't have genuine, sincere faith. And Jesus said, I didn't know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So let's look at what James addresses here as he talks about faith and works and how those two things come together. Uh, we know, before we get there, we know that we're not saved by works, right? Amen, church? There's nothing that we do that earns God's favor or merit that can earn us salvation. That is by grace alone through faith alone. But through that passage, and we're going to read it in a moment, that's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. 
through that passage, Paul also addresses works. And Martin Luther, who was the father of the Reformation, the reason that we sit here in this church today rather than in a Catholic church, is because he said that, yes, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, but that faith is not alone. And that's what James speaks of here. So let's read this passage together. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So the rhetorical question that James is posing to the church is, if you profess that you have faith, you claim and say that you have faith, yet you have nothing in your life that shows that you have been transformed and made new, a new creation in Christ, and that you now live differently, holy, sanctified, set apart from him, that you say these things and yet you don't live as though that is true of you, is that the kind of faith that can save? What do you think the answer to his question is? Remember I taught y'all last week? You'd be heads like this. That's not a faith that saves. That's what he is saying here. What good is it? What value is it, church, if you say and profess you have faith, but you have no evidence in your life that you have been made new in Christ and transformed by his blood? Because that's what the scripture says. That when we come to Christ, when we surrender all to Christ, he makes us a what? New creation. And what happens to the old? It dies. It passes away. So if we say we have faith and yet that's not transpired, then that faith is not the kind of faith that saves. He goes on to illustrate what this is going to look like. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And so let's answer that question today. If someone comes to you in need and all you do is give them something that's from your voice, something of speech, have you done anything for them? A few of you have learned. Let's try it all. No? No. What good is it? So let's give an example of our context here and now. Recently, we collected diapers and clothes and wipes for the call mall. There's a great need uh, within this community in Union County of foster children. And they have a great need for these items. And they came and they presented the need to us. And then let's say we as a church then decided, well, I hope that you get those things that you need. Have we done anything to minister to the families that need it or to the ministry that's trying to reach out to them? No. What proves that we're willing to go in with them? What proves that we're willing to meet those needs? The fact that we brought it, the fact that we gathered it together and that we took it to him. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and you say... Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed. What good is that? So he gives us a physical reality of what this spiritual picture looks like. If you say you have faith, yet you don't have the works that show that that is genuine and sincere in your life. What good is it? He goes on to say, verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works. Is dead, And that's what Martin Luther was saying. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But upon that salvific work of Christ in our life and our being renewed and transformed, we then are going to want to and desire to do what he has commanded and asked of us. Right, church? Jesus said, if you love me, what are we going to do? Keep his commandments. John said in the book of 1 John that when we have this love of Christ and when it is compelled us and transformed us, his commandments, those things that he has asked of us to walk holy, to walk sanctified, to do the things that he has commanded and asked of us, it's no longer a burden. Why is that? Because we are so in love with Christ and our heart has been rendered new, that old heart that was impenitent, that old heart that was stubborn and stiff-necked, the book of Ezekiel says that's been ripped from our chest. The heart of stone that will not listen, that will not bend its will to the will of the Father. It has been removed. 
And God then places in the heart of flesh that beats for him. And he says, I'm going to fill it with my spirit and cause you, empower you to live for me and to do and walk for me. You understand that? Do you believe that today? That that is what the scripture teaches and says. We sang the song, I want to know your ways so that I can walk with you. Well, church, we got to know his ways. Amen? we got to know what it is that he says about faith and following him. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I'm going to demonstrate that I have a genuine and sincere faith by how I live my life and the fruit that is born thereof. Again, Jesus said, you're going to know them by their fruit, by what they do, how they live. Let's skip down. Verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So we go back to his initial question. What good is it, brothers, if you say you have faith, but you have not works? Is that a faith that leads to life? James answers, faith apart from works is dead. It leads not to life. So what is this going to look like practically for us? What is it going to be demonstrated as? Well, let's turn to Matthew uh, chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to begin in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? So the picture that Jesus is painting through this is to say that those who are righteous, those who have been separated unto me, those who have given their lives to me and follow me in obedience. They have done these works. They have fulfilled my commandments because of their love for me and because of the power of the Spirit living in their life. And they ask the question, well, when did we see you in this destitute state? How did we come to your aid in such a way? And look at verse 40. And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. Church, when we walk out the truth of the word of God, when we fulfill it and live it, and not just the parts that we like, not just the parts that are easy, but every facet of it. If you love me, you're going to do and keep and walk in my ways as I have commanded you, the Lord Jesus said. And when that is made evident, when that is demonstrated by how we live our lives and the things that we do, Jesus says, you have done that unto me. But look at the converse of this, verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. 
naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they will also answer saying, Lord, you see how they address him as Lord there. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will say to them, truly I say to you, you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So what's the difference here? They profess him as Lord, they claim him as Lord, and yet they did not fulfill what he desired of them, right? They did not do his commandments. They did not do and walk in a manner that was pleasing unto him. They still professed it, Lord, when did we see you this way? And he said, because you did not fulfill my word, you did not walk in my ways, you did not do it unto me. And again, I go back to Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, didn't we? And he said, I never knew you. What's the only way to eternal life? Jesus Christ. And if he says, I don't know you, we have no relationship, do we have a chance? Therefore, verse 46 is where he says, these go to eternal punishment. But the ones who had genuine and sincere faith, that's what it means to be righteous. You have been made right, put in right standing before God because of faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. They go into what? Eternal life. They inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 34 says that this inheritance was prepared before the foundation of the world for those who trust in Christ through faith. And when we go back to John, where we began this journey in John chapter 2, it says there that they believed in his name, but they had not faith. They did not have a sincere faith. It was superficial, only on the surface, only a confession of something because of what they witnessed, not because of the belief that they had within their spirit and soul. Do we have genuine faith? James says, I will show you my faith by the way I live my life. Jesus says, you're going to be able to witness that. You're going to be able to see that. You will know people by their fruit. And church, let me say this. If we can see and recognize individuals by their fruit, and we can't see into a person's heart. This, back in John chapter 2, it says he didn't need anybody to bear witness about him, for he knew what was in man. He could peer inside and divide all the way to joint and marrow and be able to see even the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. If we can bear witness and see it, how much more can Jesus know whether or not we truly follow him and believe him? We cannot hide that from him. Many believed in his name, but it was superficial. Have you given your life in all to Christ? Have you surrendered all to him in faith? And then does the fruit of the Spirit, is it blossoming? Is it blooming? Is it seen as evidence that people can witness and see? But even outside of that, can you see the fruit? Can you bear witness to the fact that your life has been transformed by the gospel. Don't allow others to determine that for you. You examine your own life to see if that is true of you. I want to now kind of shift gears and go back to the illustration. I asked if I had a blue marble and no one believed and then we talked about faith and then a few, uh, including AJ to his chagrin, raised his hand and said he believed and then I confessed I did not have a blue marble in my pocket. And the point was not to lead A.J. or anyone else astray, but it was just to illustrate that reality. But then the Lord spoke to me and showed me that that is something that we need to be cautious of and aware of. I make every effort to never give you my opinion or what I might think or believe when I stand before you to preach or to teach. My desire in my heart is to only give you this. I want you to know what the Word of God says so that you can know His ways and walk 
in them. But the illustration shows a point, too. I am a man that is fallible. And so what I want of you is to never trust everything that I say. To never trust that what the preacher says, therefore, since I'm the preacher and I stand here before you, that it is true. What is truth, church? It's this. And again, I, I say I make every effort to only give you the word of God. But don't simply believe something because the one who stands before you teaching it says it. And I want to illustrate this through Scripture. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11 will begin in verse 1. As Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he has great pain that is plaguing his heart and his mind, and, and it deals with their genuine, sincere faith and devotion unto Christ. And listen to what he says. I wish you would bear with me in, in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that the ser as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one that we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one that you received, or if you accept a different gospel than the one that you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Now, there's a lot there, but I want to focus on the, the latter part of that. Paul says, I'm afraid that there's going to be some that might come in among you. And just as the serpent deceived Eve from the truth, they might lead you astray from a sincere and perfect and pure devotion unto Christ. And he goes on to say that someone may come in your midst. And if they preach a gospel that differs from the one that's found in the word of God, you put up with it and you're OK with it. If they present to you a Jesus that looks different than the one that the scriptures testify about, you put up with it. This is what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. Why is it that they tolerate it? Why is it that they put up with it? It's because they are allowing themselves to believe whatever is presented before them rather than measure it against the word of God. Do you see that? Do you understand that today? Whoever stands before them to teach or to preach, they accept it readily because they think that, that person comes with good intention and good heart and a pure spirit and comes in the voice of the spirit of the living God. And church, my prayer is, is that pastors that fill pulpits, that would be their heart, that they want to present to you the very word of God. But you don't simply readily accept it you measure it against the word. What does that mean for you, church? You have to know what this says, right? How are you going to know his ways to walk in them? How are you going to know what it is that he says that is true? You have to be in the word of God. You have to know what it is that he has for us. And I, I, I lay myself before you and I say, never trust it because Brother Jonathan says it. I want to only give you the word, but don't believe it simply because I say it. Believe it because it's found here. Amen? Y'all with me today? Y'all okay with that? I don't want to lead anyone astray, nor do I want you to listen to any and everyone. Some people listen to podcasts and sermons online and all that stuff, and that's great. Measure it against the word of God. And I want to give you one more example of Acts chapter 17, if you'll turn there. Acts chapter 17, we're going to begin in verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they, when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So I, I want to paint the picture of what's transpiring here. 
Paul and Silas have been in Thessalonica. They have been ministering to the church at Thessalonica. They've been there preaching the gospel. That was their ministry. That was what they were doing. So when they are sent away to Berea and they arrive at the Jewish synagogue, what is it that they're going to be doing? Preaching the gospel, right? They're going to be preaching the gospel to these people in Berea. That's their intention. That's what's happening here. The brothers send them away. They arrive in Berea. They go into the synagogue so that they can speak to the Jews about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to present to them the word of God. Look at verse 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So Paul and Silas arrive in this synagogue. They begin to preach the word of God. They begin to preach the gospel. And the people there receive it with eagerness, it says, but they examine it in accordance with the scriptures to see if what Paul and Silas are saying are so in accordance to what? The word of God. They're not just simply trusting that it's so. They examine the scriptures. And I want you to understand the significance of this. First, I want to define what it means to examine in the original language. It means to give judicial investigation to. It is not a casual event. It's something that they have to pour themselves into to see and investigate. Are these things that are being said true? And the scriptures, what were the scriptures that they had at the time? Old Testament, right? Okay, so we flip to our Old Testament and we have a glossary and we have an index and we can find books of the Bible and we can go to chapter and verse and do all of that. Do they have that option? No. Did they have Google or Bible apps where they could just punch something in and it pulls it up for them? No. What did they have? They had a scroll. And in order to understand if Paul and Silas were speaking and preaching the truth in accordance with the gospel message that they were presenting, they had to pour over the scroll. And it said they did this daily. They had judicial investigation into the scrolls of God, the word of God, to see and determine is what they're preaching true. Oh, church, that we, all of us, would be so diligent in that. That we would desire to know what the word of God says so that we can see if what is being said is true. They received it with eagerness. They wanted to hear, but they weren't going to be accepting of it until it matched the word of the living God. He said, you confess that the scriptures they had were of the Old Testament. They didn't have the gospel accounts. They didn't have the remainder of the New Testament to show what a life transformed by Christ looks like. They only had the Old Testament. Paul and Silas were coming preaching the good news, preaching the gospel. And we might think in our time, well, that's not found in the Old Testament. I'm here to tell you, yes, it is. And don't take my word for that. You examine it according to Scripture, but I'm going to give you one. And it comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. John chapter 5, verse 39. Speaking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of the law. He says, you search the Scriptures. What were the Scriptures again that they had? The Old Testament, right? Seeking or feeling or desiring that you might find salvation in them. And you do not know, Jesus said. This is Jesus speaking. You go and look at it. Red letters. You do not know that they, the scriptures, which were the scriptures again? The Old Testament. Testify about me. The gospel. The good news. Paul and Silas went preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. The people there, these Bereans, they received it with eagerness but they examined it according to the scriptures. They gave investigation. Does what is being presented, taught, and preached match the word of God? I didn't know what Wesley and Barbara were going to do today as far as songs, but God knew. And one of the songs that we sang, Show me your ways that I can walk with you. Let's examine the word of God together. Let's look at what his word says so that we can know 
His way, and then we can see, are we walking His way or not? Amen, church? Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this picture of faith that we see at the end of chapter 2 of the book of John. Lord, I thank you that we can recognize the difference between a sincere faith and a superficial one. God, and I pray that you bring revelation in our lives to that reality. Father, I thank you for your word of truth. I thank you for how it enlightens us and exposes us and reveals to us and instructs us and encourages us and corrects us. God, and it's my prayer that we as the church would no longer neglect your word, but that we would judicially investigate, that we would give ourselves over to the word of God, to examine it daily. So that we might know what you desire and acquire of us. So that we might know your ways and walk in them. And God, when we do that, you will be glorified. And oh Lord, that's my prayer in my heart today. That you would receive glory through those of us here at Union Baptist Church. Because we have given ourselves over to Christ. We have given ourselves over to the Word to live by it and to abide by it. And that you would receive all honor due you and all glory to your name. And it's in that beautiful, glorious name that we pray and we ask these things as we conclude today. Amen.